So this is for a little uh, change of uh, change of pace. I love what Art is doing, but uh, if you were seeing a meta currencies right now, we're probably now getting to uh, uh, more sub sub currencies um, or sub or earthy um, currencies. Let me just bring a picture up here and we're all together, hopefully on the same page. Now I'll probably need to log it, log it back in. So last night uh, over sh Chardonnay and sushi at the uh, welcoming reception, so somebody heard the term uh, slow money for the first time and uh, shall go unnamed and said, well, slow money. I don't know anybody on Wall Street that uh, would say, I want my money to be slower. And uh, to which I said, yeah, that's probably exactly the point because slow money, oops, I was told I had to grab this one here. So slow, slow money is not about Wall Street. Um, uh, slow money is probably more about the rest, um, the rest of us. So I asked them, so do you want your food actually to be faster or slower in the future? And that's also a question that I would um, uh, leave you guys with. So, so uh, slow money. Um, of course, uh, it derives uh, a little bit from slow food. Uh, it's a national organization and a relatively young uh, movement, uh, uh, about three years old, and uh, written or inspired by a book, Slow Money, Inquires on the uh, Nature of Slow Money by Woody Tash. Now we have uh, uh, about 15 active chapters throughout the country, and our mission is to direct investments into local food systems. And uh, if slow food is about um, know where your food comes from and eat locally, slow money is probably about know where your money is at and spend it locally. So that's a little bit of the, of the reference. And there are um, six slow money principles. The first one is already uh, very much um, right on the money. It's called, uh, we must bring money down to earth. And I think with everything that we have seen in the last three or four years in the financial system, there's probably a, a very underlying truth to it that probably rings through with a lot of people and um, at least made it into the room, but we're finding more and more people, that's why we have 15 active chapters, that bring out 50 to uh, 100 people every month uh, throughout the country. Because the second uh, slow money principle is there is such a thing as money being too fast and you can look up and some the other slow money, uh, slow money principles online on slowmoney.org. But at the height of the crisis, like around 2008, somebody looked at and made an al uh, analysis of the stock trades. So 70% of all stock trades are actually done by high frequency traders. And high frequency traders hold uh, their trades for an average of how long? Two seconds. Hmm? Two seconds. Uh, yeah, okay. You, he says two seconds back then in 2008, they analyzed like an average of 11 seconds, 70% um, is done by high frequency traders. So this is pretty much at the opposite end of it. And, uh, and so far we don't have uh, the right tools yet. So I, I'm personally also invested in uh, some uh, food ventures. This is uh, Soul Food Farm in Buckable. They um, do pastured um, chicken and eggs, uh, best eggs you will ever eat. and I. Um, I have, uh, I'm part of a slow money investor group there and we get, uh, we gave them a loan and I'm getting the principal back in cash and the, uh, and the interest I actually get in kind. So it's, uh, I brought my interest payments uh, today, they're actually <laughs> wonderful. So these are really an interest, uh, uh, these are my interest payments from Soul Food Farm. Uh, the problem is, uh, this is all nice and cute. Um, it's not really that scalable uh, for a number of reasons, one of them being my doctor telling me something about cholesterol uh, <laughs> intake, so how many I can uh, eat of those, but also it's, it's not yet a scalable uh, form of doing it, but I will talk a little bit about this later on, that there is a point where technology comes into the game, but something that has really scaled nicely is something that Ari Dörfel has done. So Ari Dörfel owns um, Gather restaurant in Berkeley, it's uh, uh, for me probably the best uh, uh, most amazing restaurant in the Bay Area, uh, mm -hmm. locally sourced and uh, also like 
when I discovered it's like wonderful also where the tables and the lands come from and all this likes and um, Ari Dreyfus um, co-owns and, and uh, co-founded the restaurant and uh, t uh, went a little bit the slow money route and he also was the executive director for, uh, for slow money uh, for a while and when I heard the story for the first time that Ari told me how he financed this restaurant I was thinking to myself Ari I hope you don't tell that story to anybody else this is just scary scary as shit and then, <laughs> and then we had a lot of meetings actually uh, in the building above the other restaurants on Mondays and Tuesdays and uh, I went down to the restaurant afterwards to have dinner and I saw this restaurant is always full Monday, Tuesday, any day of the, need, uh, any day of the week it's just full, people go there and, and that's a, that's a, that probably has something to do with, uh, with how you finance the, uh, the restaurant so maybe Ari, you should tell the story, and that's why you brought Ari here. So why don't you tell the story how you use uh, slow money to um, invest uh, to to get your business finance, and then I come back to how we try to scale it up from a slow money side. Thank you. Is this on? Hello. The button turns it on. I can project. Do I need to be speaking into this for recording purposes? I don't know. I want to hand you the mic. Arnold, you want to hand it? Just take this. Great. It's always fun. Feel more like Phil Donahue with one of these. <laughs> um, hi, nice to meet you. I didn't know you felt that way about Gather. That's awesome. I think it's the best restaurant in the Bay Area. I do too, so thank you. Anyone here been to Gather? Cool, a few people. Thank you. You had a good meal. Um, so, uh, Gather was a 10 year project. We started conceiving of it actually in um, 2000. Um, and set out for 10 years to try to figure out how to build a name for ourselves in the food industry um, before opening the restaurant. And the shorter version of the story is before crowdfunding really exists and before I had even learned about something called slow money, uh, we won the contract to build, gather at a building called the David Brower Center in downtown Berkeley. It was a place where they originally wanted Alice Waters to build a restaurant. It was a pretty highly coveted space. So we had to win the contract. We won the contract in... Uh, I guess it was March of 2008, and we were given 18 months um, to put the entire project together, and it was a giant empty shell, so we had to build it, design it, construct it, raise all the money in 18 months. Um, and we had to raise two and a half million dollars to build it because it was new construction. And so does anyone here remember what happened in the summer of 2008? Anyone? <laughs> right, so worst economy in the history of my adult life, uh, history of my parents' adult life, and we had to come up with two and a half million dollars for a restaurant considered the bottom of the food chain when it comes to investments. And we're out there trying to raise it from um, accredited investors, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars increments. And we actually saw we had raised a million uh, over uh, the December to March, December 2007 to March 2008 period. We raised about a million. And then as soon as the economy tanked, investors started to flee and that million shrank back down to about 600,000. So driving um, across the bay one day with my business partner, I said, look, it's just not gonna work to try to find 10 people to fund this restaurant. We need to go to every single person that we know and get them involved. And we were elated at the time. We were like, oh, it's Obama style. Let's do it, let's make it happen. And we called our attorney and he said, you just can't do it. You can't have more than 35 people involved in the deal, in the story. That's how private equity investments, that's how private placement memorandums work, you can't do it. And we just wouldn't take that as an answer. So long story short, we found out by researching SEC laws and guidelines that we could do something called a Regulation D offering, um, where we were allowed to have an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 unaccredited investors participate um, in the investment. And so basically I went out and tirelessly for the next 18 months raised every single one of those dollars that way. And at the end of the day, we have 100 investors that are involved in the restaurant. And when Marcos, uh, when Arno, sorry, he's called Marco, he's like another friend of ours, and I hold them both in high esteem, so I can't remember the person. Um, when Arno mentioned that the way we raise money probably had something to do with the success of the restaurant, it entirely has. Having that many people involved in an investment provided an opportunity to create a guerrilla marketing force that is out there day in and day out, singing the praises of the restaurant to everybody that they know. They're sending people there from out of town. They're having birthday parties. They're doing everything. And there's not a day that goes by um, that one of them is not in the restaurant. And so from a practical standpoint, it's actually been amazing um, because these people help us be busy. 
I understand that business is good, so they're very excited. If business wasn't good, it might be a very different experience. But the most important thing is not just that these folks get people to come in. The more important piece is what relates directly to slow money, which is raising money this way, um, which is very personal. And I had to spend as much time with someone who gave us $5,000 as I did with someone who gave us $450,000. Um, was the intimacy factor. It was the relationship dynamic. Uh, instead of just going to a few people with a lot of money, I went to a ton of people with a little money and got to know every single one of them. And the relationships that have been formed and the community that's been generated has been the equally, if not more, valuable part of the entire experience. Um, people come in, you know, I got, there's countless investors that have had children since the thing has happened, and they come in with the kids and you see the kids. And there's people whose older children have gotten married, and there's people who've never met each other, but they're both into the same thing in the world, and they're dining next to each other unknowingly, and we get to help create those connections. So the immediacy of the investment relationship, the transparency of the investment relationships in terms of these people knowing where their money's going. Um, the vast majority of the investors in the restaurant uh, live in the Bay Area, and the majority of them live in the East Bay. So they get to go and basically put their mouth where their money is. They get to taste it, they get to touch it, it's tangible, it's immediate, it's real. They get to experience relationships because of it. Um, so that sense of direct and transparent and personal, those are the same guidelines even that an institution in, in um, San Francisco called RSF Social Finance uses to guide how they um, um, structure their investment opportunities and their portfolio of investments. They're a very progressive, basically bank-like institution. So we basically subscribe to the same exact principles, and that's why we we're able to have a lot of um, success raising the money. And the last thing that I'll say, and turn it back to um, Arno, um, is that it, it worked. It worked not just in terms of raising money, it worked not just in terms of bringing people in the door, but now two and a half years later, um, we were named um, top 20 new restaurants in the country by Esquire magazine. Our chef was picked as chef of the year. Uh, his, one of his dishes was top 10 in food and wine. So it, it proves that these sorts of techniques are not just for like the grassroots, um, crunchy granola head in the sky sort of take on currency and investment, but very practically can be used to build successful institutions that can then inspire further economic development using the same sort of approach. So we just feel grateful in every capacity that we've been able to do everything we've done and now serve as an example for other people to try to model. That cover? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think you want to take your friends together. If you're if you're in the Bay Area, they will thank you. Um, and I think the future of money will be about uh, having the money relationship also uh, partnered up with the human relationship or food relationship. And I think that's something important to keep in mind as we're talking about how the future of money is on mobile and virtual. I think the future of money also has to be uh, slow. No, 18 months was very slow. And I think that probably s will scare a few people when you hear about this, uh, starting your own business with slow money. So we're now thinking about how can we actually uh, introduce new ways to deal with the economy um, that are less tedious and more um, 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 user-friendly, if you will. So, and you hear, and hear it uh, here first. So slow money is a, um, launching a new crowdfunding service. This is about uh, putting money into food businesses and in the way how food actually should be financed. Should, food needs time to grow. Food needs, uh, needs time to be cared for. It's not like your iPhone that is being assembled in two days by uh, children in China. It actually takes like um, uh, months and months uh, to grow. So it should be pre-financed. So here, this is a crowdfunding platform. It's called Credibles. If you eat, you're an investor, which allows people to even put a smaller amount, just five, not just 5,000, maybe just even 50 or $200 into a place or into a food source that they like and then eat uh, basically as a prepaid tab, eat it then over time as, um, as they see fit. So Credible stands for um, um, edible credits because that's what you receive. You basically prepay, get credits, they're edible. Um, this, you hear it at first on the, there are Kickstarter and other uh, crowdfunding platforms out there where you basically donate, but you don't get basically a return back. And for the on food entrepreneur, it's terribly uh, interesting because they don't have to go 
to pre-finance their growing through dipping into their line of credit and pay a bank interest. Here you actually pay, um, pay your customers' interest in form of um, goods and services that you actually have in your power to, uh, to produce. So we'll, we will actually, the in, there's an interesting currency aspect to it because as there are more businesses coming out that, that people hold prepaid balances of, the credibles are actually interchangeable, also used uh, to be used at, at different uh, businesses. So it turns a little bit into a virtual currency where you can take your prepaid money to different businesses that participate in the system and have been prepaid by their customers. So this is where uh, edible credits is not just a one-way gift certificate, it's actually a currency for healthy eating. And yes, we're here at like future of money and, and slow technology, um, mobile redemption and uh, doing a real-time transaction so that your credible balance goes from your account to the business where your consumers, yeah, we do that too, um, because that's how it's being done. But mostly, it's, uh, it's of course uh, about the deliciousness of the um, edible credits that you guys are eating. So, if you want to find out more about this, I encourage you to go to Slow Money or to Credibles.org and uh, find out. So, we're trying to hire right now people to scale it up and get um, some strategic investors in uh, to make that the new um, scalable platform for regular investors, not just accredited investors, to become investors in their food. So let's, let's open the concept of slow money up for, uh, for um, discussion. One other comment um, you and I were talking about earlier. Um, in terms of the money side of things, it's also worth noting we have begun paying the investors back and pay back more than 10% of the investment already. And we're now starting to build the second restaurant um, that will open in spring 2014. And the take home point there is that we could, because of the success of the first restaurant, go and get the entire thing funded by two or three people. But we're not. Um, where crowdfunding has been something that people have gone to as sort of a last ditch resort is to, oh, how am I going to come up with this money? Using crowdfunding proactively is part of the message. And we're going to go back to the same hundred people, if not more, and say, let's all be involved again, not because we have to but because it's a new way of engaging the investment and strategy is effective. So, yes, questions? What kind of things have you done for your, I'm sorry. So, so I have two questions for you. What kind of things have you done for your investors with regards to engagement? Um, you know, i.e. dinners, have you thought about a cookbook, those kind of things. And the second question I have is, have you ever heard of Rouse? Not heard of Rouse. Um, let me make a suggestion to you. So there's one restaurant in New York that has a nine-year waiting list. They have a book out. You can buy their food. And the interesting thing about Rouse is they actually sell, sold the tables. And the table is sold as a piece of property. And you have the rights on a, on a nightly basis to that table. And if you don't use it, um, you have the ability to turn around and let someone else use it. But the, the waiting list to get into Rouse is, is nine years. And the, it's been in the family, uh, this is I guess now they're going on their third generation. And if you haven't read the story, I invite you to, they actually have the, a book out about it. It's one of the most fascinating things I've ever read. So as a suggestion to you, take a look at it. And uh, I'm just so pleased for you. Congratulations, tonight, and I mean that from my heart. Thank you, that's sweet. Felt it coming from your heart. I wonder what their no-show rate is. That sounds amazing. <laughs> well, it, uh, as I said, um, it, it, they've got a whole bunch of facts on it. It's really interesting. Thanks, take a look at it. It's R-A-O apostrophe S. I, I was actually given um, for something that I did. I was actually sent an entire portfolio of their products, okay, that they package. And it all arrived in this gigantic box from a friend of mine. It was like a season ticket sort of thing. It was really cool. And the answer to your first question is what have we done in terms of investor engagement? Um, simple sort of stuff. I mean, we are actually doing a cookbook that's in process right now. Uh, we have an annual investor meeting all the time. Every now and then we have special events for them. We have a newsletter that we send to them fairly regularly. But largely most of that engagement in what we do for the investors really comes down to providing them an awesome place that feels like home to come and see people who dine on food that they can trust. 
and that's really what most of it's about. We also give every investor 1% of their initial investment in credit at the restaurant every year. And the beauty of that is they get to have that on their house account and oftentimes they gift that to other people. So again, they get to spread the love of their restaurant that they own. The, the, the other side, just I'm talking about a microphone, sorry. The, the other suggestion I might add is, is doing some type of cooking classes and things like that to engage them and their friends and share recipes. Yeah, and, and I think you, you're completely right. You're bringing the, basically the, the human relationship into the money relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage the entrepreneurs as they offer prepaid uh, credibles to come up with interesting offers uh, for certain amounts. So if you put more than $500 into a um, Parish Hall restaurant, which is in Brooklyn, you get invited to, um, to invest the only parties. Uh, Naya, I think when you put, uh, invest more than $2,000, you can like determine your own dream flavor and they give you a bucket of, uh, of this. Uh, I think uh, Catherine, who owns Farmhouse Culture, which is a sauerkraut business in Santa Cruz, uh, I think uh, at a certain amount they would name a flavor after your firstborn or something. <laughs> and um, this is actually a soul food farm where I get the eggs. I got a very unexpected um, investor benefit. Last August I was looking for a place to have an outdoors uh, birthday party and Alexis, the owner, offered, hey, you can have my place. And, um, pay wasn't even on the table and I would have paid probably 500 plus uh, dollars if I had like rented a space somewhere. So it's like tangible in and intangible benefits. So we're encouraging that uh, not to think just in terms of money as you have something to offer. Other, others? Uh, just a quick question. I don't know how familiar you two are with the, uh, the Jobs Act legislation um, that was recently signed. Uh, basically changed some of the, the, the restrictions around both the Reg D um, offering and also crowdfunding. Um, and so if you could speak to that, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm not specifically familiar with that piece of legislation and when it's time to change it, I can speak to those models. Um, what you're referring is to both the House and the Senate basically passed this new piece of uh, crowdfunding legislation that would make it easier for regular people who are not accredited investors to put money into businesses up to uh, up to a certain limit, I think that, uh, and it depends like which piece you read, the House piece or the Senate piece, and there were like thousand dollar limits and other limits. Uh, lots of lawyers are actually trying to read what was actually passed, and then uh, what has to happen, the SEC uh, will have to write rules about this, and so this is probably a process until it becomes legal, but, uh, which everybody says will be at the beginning of next year. But we have people in the slow money world actually looking at this, like how can we, offer a crowdfunding solution that actually would also pay you monetary returns for lower amounts. This, of course, is not treated as a gift certificate, uh, uh, sorry, this is not treated as a security, so we're like staying clean of SEC rules with that crowdfunding model because it's basically like a gift certificate, nobody's promising any interest rates. So the crowdfunding solution will make it interesting and this is, we are welcoming this tremendously that this is uh, made possible. Nobody knows how exactly it will be and there were a number of players who are also, you will see a myriad of crowdfunding solutions that will take, uh, will try to take advantage of this and then the, sort, the field will sort itself a little bit out. Right. Uh, I guess to, to Ari's point, I think uh, just specifically to your, you know, the ways that you did, uh, should significantly impact you know, the, the ease with which you could, you could raise money from non-accredited um, through Reg D or through other, through other means. Yeah, and the other thing that's actually related that other organizations are doing, including um, a really progressive organization called the People's Community Market that's been trying to eradicate food deserts in Oakland and build a community grocery where they don't currently exist, uh, is they're resurrecting the DPO model, which is something very few people are familiar with. Everyone's familiar with the IPO. But the DPO, the direct public offering, is something that's existed as an opportunity for years. No one knows about it. And they're doing it. It's basically public stock offerings um, for local businesses. And that's how they're now doing it. They're basically finding investors through people who live in West Oakland and want their own grocery store in their own neighborhood. So the DPO is yet another um, thing that's, you know, and again, all of these things, like A, like D, DPOs, have varying degrees for good reason of due diligence that needs to be um, engaged in order to make sure that people aren't being fraudulent and that sort of stuff. But to your point, they are making it easier, trying to make it easier for both to do it. 
All right, we'll quit right. <coughs> you need, need to talk in the mic or I can just, uh, Since we're talking about money, uh, what kind of returns RRR are you seeing in the first three to five years on, and what did you offer RE? In other, other words, did you make any kind of indication, or if in circumstance, what kind of results are you experiencing? I mean, is that a half a percent egg box, or is that a, a seven percent egg, egg box? You know, what, what are your, and, and again, that is probably less of a motivator. Yet, at the same time, it's nice to kind of have measured results and see what you're experiencing. I think the interesting way how uh, interest is being paid if you pay it in goods and services, mm -hmm. uh, this per our loan contract is officially 6% to me, mm -hmm. but it's not 6% to her, uh, to the farmer, because it's whatever it takes to produce uh, and to get the, uh, the chicken lay the eggs and package them and and get it to the store where I pick it up. So that's that's uh, um, th that's important for her. It's m maybe just like two percent. For me, it's six percent because I value it as as retail. So Parish Hall will act. Uh, so you put two hundred dollars in, or they say their rule is uh, if you put at least two hundred uh, percent dollars in, then you get two hundred and twenty credibles. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a ten percent incentive. But it's 10% for you as the customer. For them, it's basically what it takes to put that food on the table. Mm -hmm. That's a nice thing. If they were to pay 10% at the bank to, to get that money, that would be actually hard cash out of the door um, for, for a line of credit um, uh, that they would be dipping into. So that's, actually, that's the, the, the economics of in-kind payments. It's actually the, the producer pays it at wholesale, and it has the value for you as, uh, at, at retail. Technical question follow-up. Is that contract a security? Is that contract on the 6% loan a, con a security? This was just a one-off. This was like a, a promissory note, and as a loan, um, it would be, uh, it was a very non-scalable, uh, eight people of us got together and made and made that loan. That would be falling in and the security because uh, there is a return promised, versus this is a gift certificate, right, where you basically get a volume a discount. So we and the dis and the gift certificate rules are actually different from state to state. So right now we when we say it's a limited beta. Right now we're in, in California and in New York City, and we're we're covering the rules in the other states. But this is a legal framework. Uh, we're surprised that uh, that it hasn't been used yet on a on on a larger scale. But just as a little detour to to crowdfunding and Kickstarter and all of this, all their work actually goes up to the point of the transaction. When all the money is in, they, they give the money to the, to, to the entrepreneur, then they're done. And maybe then the entrepreneur still has to send out some t-shirts. That's pretty much it. If you put money into, into a prepaid, and then you have accounts, the real work actually starts afterwards, because then it's basically managing the prepaid tab. And there are ways that we have figured out already with the uh, currency system, Bernal Bucks, how we uh, how we make sure if a business goes out of business, the other ones are not harmed. Nobody is paying more of their fair share. This is what we, uh, uh, that's what we're using the system in the background to do a fair balancing of uh, shared credits. Everybody does like post store credits, so there's gift certificates, but doing shared credits is actually a hard thing that we cracked. Uh, any other questions? Uh, how many, do we still have some? Okay. Questions about food, slow money? You didn't, I already didn't answer my question about what kind of return is, is, did it as investors get? What did they get on oh. gather? Uh, Ari, okay. Uh, we have 60 seconds left. We did a preferred payback, so our investors get paid back 95% of all of our profits until the principal's paid back, and we project it takes about eight years in total to do that. After that, we split the restaurant, certain percentage us, certain percentage for them, uh, and they get roughly between a 7 and 10% uh, disbursement on an annual basis in perpetuity, plus their one percent. So we're oftentimes held up as sort of the poster child for slow money because we did this while slow money was sort of scaling and I was the ED for a while. But in a lot of ways, it's not traditionally what we now call slow money investment because that's better than market return right there. We're actually pe giving people good money on their money, um, which again is proof positive that you can do good with your money and make more money while doing it. Thank the investors also get some credit, Yeah, one percent every year. Thank you. Yeah, and we're right now we're on we're on target for that. Thank you, Vincent. 
I mean, uh, you have to imagine most <laughs> most rest uh, like eighty percent of restaurants, your restaurants never turn a, uh, a profit. So that's actually an amazing feat to pull that off wow. that fast. Cool. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>